Welcome to Christ Lutheran here in Brenham, Texas. If you're watching online, we're really happy to have you with us. I'm Pastor Mark Groves, and we're really glad that you're here, especially on this special day when we're going to worship and celebrate our faith in Jesus Christ using polka music. <laughs> now listen, you may not know this, but the origins of polka go back to 1830 to a little town called Kostelec in uh, Bohemia, which was part a region part of what we now know as the Czech Republic. So it really has Czech origins, but we always think of it as German or something like that. But Bohemia was surrounded or had the borders of Germany and Austria uh, and Poland as well. It is the Polish national dance today. Uh, it was there in Kostelec that where a young girl by the name of Anna, and I'm going to mess up this name, Chaldomova, later as Anna Slavic, who became, uh, who was an, serving as a nanny to some children, and she began to teach those children in her care to sing and to dance, and in the process, she invented her own dance. And I'm going to mess this up. It's in halftime, right? Two, four, that's half, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and while she would do this while singing a tune that she made up, and soon... The village heard about this, including the village teacher by the name of Joseph Neruda, who was the first to actually write the tune down in music, and he gave it a name. It was called, I can't say it in Slovak, so it's, it's Uncle Nurma Bought a White Horse. <laughs> that was the very first polka song, right? And he actually named the dance polka, P-U-L-K is how we would pronounce it, which means half step. Soon polka got to be called polka. Its popularity made its way to Prague and then soon Vienna, where it became a favorite for many. And then in 1840, it, it was received in Paris and began to sweep through the rest of the Europe in Europe at that time in private and public dances in what became known as polka mania, which just kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? It shortly then made its way to America through European immigrants, and thanks be to God, it is still with us today. Now, eventually, it gave way to the two-step here in Texas. It influenced all kinds of music throughout the country. In fact, you probably don't know that Cleveland, Ohio, is the polka capital of the United States. How about that? It also, uh, it also influenced music like ragtime and jazz, and even made its way here to Texas where we have the two-step, and you can hear some of its influences in the music, and in Mexico, where we can hear that music in mariachi music, right? So that's all part, all influenced by polka. I didn't know any of this. This is awesome. Um, let's see. After, it kind of waned for a little bit, and then after World War II, it started to gain some momentum again when a lot of Polish immigrants came to the United States and made it popular once again. I mentioned that there was various styles of, uh, of polka music. The scriptures remind us that music is a gift from God. In, sec in Second Chronicles, we hear the trumpeters and the musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments. The singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good, His love endures forever. And of course, we can hear lots of other places in the scriptures, including the psalmist who prays with great joy, praise him with the sounding of trumpet and praise him with harp and lyre, praise him with tremble and dancing, 
no dancing. <laughs> Not for me, anyway. Praise him with string and pipe and praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay? So let's begin our worship. And, and I invite you all to stand as you are able as we join our voices and confess our faith, saying together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace for the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who suffer here, who, all who offer here their worship and praise. Help, save, and defend us, gracious Lord. We gather this morning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's polka. Confident that God receives our joys and our concerns, we offer our prayers for the church, for those in need, and for all of creation. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we pray for the church and all servants of the gospel. Equip rostered and lay ministers to proclaim that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. 
Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we pray for the well-being of creation. Teach us to care for the world you've given us to steward. Help those who are vulnerable to this extreme weather and those who suffer from the heat. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate God, we pray for the nations. Instill in all who govern the ability to discern between good and evil. Free those who are oppressed and protect those facing danger. Help us to promote peace in the world. We pray for our president and all elected leaders, for those who come first in our times of crisis, for those who fight our fires, those who protect and serve to keep us safe, and those who work for cause, the cause of peace in the world, and especially those who do, in, do so in places and positions of great peril. Lord, in your mercy, Merciful God, we pray for all in need. Protect those suffering war. Shelter any who are in poverty. Clothe the naked. Soothe all who grieve and heal the sick. O oh, loving God, you know our concerns, and yet we offer them as an embrace of our faith as we speak them at this time. Lord, in your mercy, Holy God, we pray for this congregation, those gathered in person, online, and those who are absent. We give you thanks for the gifts that you have given us to proclaim the good news that the kingdom is near. And today we give you thanks for the gift of music and those willing to share those gifts. And for our young people who are eager to learn and serve you in their lives, Lord, in your mercy, Eternal God, we give thanks for your saints who now rest from their labors. Inspire us by their witness to share the gospel and to treasure your church. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O God, we place all for whom we pray in the name of the one who gives us life, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Would you pray with me one more time, please? Oh, loving God, we ask that you grant us your spirit this morning, that we might have ears to hear and willing hearts to serve you in these words that are offered and read, and they might, that they might be acceptable in your hearing to grow faith in those who seek you. Amen. Well, this morning we continue with our uh, series on the book of Acts which, if you remember, is the fifth book. Some people call it the fifth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And it was written by Luke, um, who is one of the gospel writers as well. And so today we find ourselves in the third chapter. Jesus has now left his disciples in body, and they have received him again in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ that is in them. And so now the church has been formed. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up, and as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up and stood on his feet and began to walk, then walking, leaping, and praising God, 
he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar that they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we made this man walk by our own power and godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant, Jesus, by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and, re and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected his holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed, and you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So when we, uh, when we teach our young people about faith or the tenets of our faith, I usually begin by asking a series of questions. I do it over and over again. It, I think repeating it kind of sinks through their adolescent brains and finds a place to land for a while. And I usually begin the session with things like, uh, um, what does the word Bible mean? Yeah, see? Why is it called a library? It's full of books, right? How many books are in this library? There we go. Yeah, see, I got them trained. And then I usually always ask this question. What does the term gospel mean? It's good news. Why is it good news? Because it tells us about the life of Jesus. That's correct. But of course, we know that it's more than that, really. Maybe a better answer would be that it tells us about the birth the life, the ministry, the persecution, the arrest, the trial, the beating, the death, his death on the cross, and the resurrection of Jesus. That would be a more accurate answer. And yet, when we say the life of Jesus, we all seem to know what that means. Jesus enters into human history in order to reveal God to us in a way that we could see and feel and touch, in a way that we could witness that God is a God who loves God's people, people who love God by loving God's people. That this God is a God who loves God's people, people who love God by loving God's people. I mean, yes, we can look around and see God all around us. If you're aware, if you're open to this, we can see God in the wonder and beauty of creation in the sunset over an ocean horizon, in the snow-capped mountain peaks against a, a deep blue sky. We can, we can see God in the miracles of medical science and in the intellect that creates technological advances. But the witness and revelation of God is most visible, most poignant and powerful in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. God come down in flesh and blood, flesh and blood that embodies the Christ, the chosen one of God who shows us how to love and through his love sets us free to let go of the weight and worry of sin, of the things that we have done and the things that we have left undone, and to reveal to us that God's kingdom is near. In fact, that God's kingdom is actually here. God enters human history and one of the most visible ways that Christ is present in the world today is through his church, who is called to share the gospel, the revelation of God through words and through our actions. Listen, this, this is the truth of the Bible. And it is the truth revealed in and through God's people, in and through those, who, those first witnesses, in and through you, and me. It is a truth that we see and hear in the earliest church, 
And through this account of Peter and John and the healing of this lame man, what I would call the first miracle of the church. You see, every day this lame man, this crippled man, had his friends carry him to one of the temple gates. And in this account, he is carried to the beautiful gate, as the scriptures call it. And there he could ask or beg for money. The first century his historian Josephus claimed that the temple at that time had nine gates that were covered with gold and silver, but there was one gate that was adorned with Corinthian brass, and that it was the most beautiful and, than all the other gates. And, and it was also much larger than the other gates. And it was said that this is the gate through which those who were prominent and wealthy came to worship in the temple. And so this would be a prime spot. This would be a choice place for someone to beg for money. Because you see, through those who were gathered were taught in the Hebrew Scriptures that they were to give alms to the poor. And so maybe, just maybe, they might be willing to drop a few coins into this beggar's cup. And yet, chances are, many of them did not see the beggar. Chances are, the beggar was invisible to most of the people who came and went on a daily basis. He became maybe part of the landscape, right? Sound familiar? I mean, we all get caught up in the busyness of our own lives, and we don't always notice the clamor around us, the voices of those in need. I mean, it's easy to do. Those times when we don't notice that there are other people, even those in our lives and in our midst, that are in need. And yet the gospel calls us to live beyond ourselves, to give us eyes to see those who are invisible, those who suffer and struggle. In this account, Peter and John are on their way to the temple for three o'clock prayers. Yes, they were now followers of Jesus, and yet they still gathered with the community to pray. And so they see this lame man out there outside the beautiful gate. Now, they must have seen him before. It seems, according to scriptures, that he, he's there on a daily basis. But maybe the Spirit of Christ in them now gives them eyes to see him again, only for the first time. Maybe they see him through the eyes of this new church. He is there outside the gate of the temple where the Jews believed that God dwelt. And like those who see him there, the beggar begins to believe that he is outside God's kingdom. He believes that he can't get in there because he is an outsider, because he is not perfect in form, he is lame or crippled. It is, belie it is believed that he must have deserved this infirmity that he carried with him. And so no one had bothered to got get him beyond the gate. He is there alone, and he cannot save himself. And neither will the world that tosses him a few coins. And though this happened to this disabled man long ago, this account, this first miracle of the church, describes us. For the truth is, is we cannot save ourselves. We do not have the strength to walk upright, to be righteous enough to make our way through the gate into the kingdom of God. And neither can the world help us, even with all the promises it offers for a wonderful life. No matter how much we have, no matter how good we try to be, the world can only carry us to the gate and no farther. For in this life, left to our own devices, we are only delivered to death. Medicine cannot save us. Science cannot save us. Education, money, even all the power that we might acquire in our lifetime cannot save us. And there's nothing wrong with all of those things if they're used rightly, but the world can only carry us to a certain place, to a certain distance, and no further. And so we sit outside the gate, and we beg for mercy. Even the, the biggest, most popular church or the most charismatic preacher can do nothing but toss us a few coins, so to speak. But thanks be to God, it's 3 o'clock, and the church has come to pray. Did you hear me there? 
the church, Christ present in these disciples, newly baptized in the Holy Spirit, have come to pray because the church is no longer in a building. It is no longer in a priest who claims righteousness, for they have no power to make anyone righteous. Only God can claim their righteousness. And as the beggar first encounters Peter and John, he's encountering the post-resurrection church, the Pentecost church. And it is here that something different is happening. Yes, the beggar hopes that they will drop a few coins in his cup, that they will be generous, that he'll get something of what the world has to offer. But that's not what happens. For it is not a few coins that he needs. It is not money that will save him. What he needs is to be inside the gate, inside the kingdom, to know a right relationship with God where he is loved and accepted, where he knows belonging, where he is made new. And yet as the beggar encounters these two apostles of the church, he is unaware of anything new, anything unique. For him, it's just business as usual. If we think about this, many today see the church in this way. They are content for the church to be merely a place of social gathering, a place where like-minded people think in human terms about the world. They believe that it's just an institution that wants to pass judgment on others where their concern is whether or not the sermon was good or entertaining, not too long and not too uncomfortable. They want to know if the music is good, the way that we like it. They want to know that the people are pleasant and if the church is successful enough to want to belong to it. The world looks at the church and sees what is human, what is ordinary. But that's not the church. That's not the Pentecost church. For this new church is not a temple made with human hands. This church is the body of Christ that lives and breathes in the hearts of God's people. People who love God by loving God's people. But Peter and John, the apostles, the first apostles of the church who are sent, say to this man, look at us. Look at us. And they are inviting the man to see something other than what is human. They want him to be clear that it is not them who is about to heal him. It is not them who is going to give him new life. Instead, it is the Christ, through Christ's church, that will do these things. And so the church declares, look at us. We who have neither gold nor silver have something else. For like Peter, we say what I do have to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, rise and walk. And then Peter took him by the hand and raised him up. Listen. It is right. Excuse me. Right that the church should feed the hungry and clothe the naked and sit with the prisoner and care for the poor. It is right that we should help those who are sick. It is right that we should care for the widow and the orphan and the stranger. It is right that we should love God with all our heart and all our mind and our soul and our strength. It is right because that is what we are called to do by Jesus Christ. It is right that we should dig wells, that we should pack us, package meals and sew quilts and care for children in our day school. It's right that we should do these things, and it's right that we should see those who are invisible to the world, those who are hurting and suffering, those who seem different, those who are outside of the kingdom. It is right that we should reach out our hand and say, rise and walk, for you too are a child of God, and the kingdom of God is yours. But listen, as we do this, and we do, do not for a second believe that it is us who are doing these things. Sure, we may get used, our resources may get used, but let's be clear, the only thing we have to offer 
The only thing that we can point to is Christ crucified and risen. For it is only by the power of his word that we, who are the crippled man, and we, who are Christ's church, his body in this place, have the power to say, rise and walk. You have been made new. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As you're able, let's stand and dance. I mean, sing. Scriptures remind us that if we believe we are without sin, we're lying to ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as his body here in this place, we confess our sin together, saying with one voice, most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister in the church of Jesus Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We take a few moments to greet each other with signs of peace. Listen, um, before I forget, and I was going to do this at the end of the service, but before I forget, I just want to take time to thank our musicians today. You know most of them. You know Ricky and Pat and Charlie and Daryl and Sarah, well, I'm going to talk about her in a second, and Vicki. And we have a special guest, guest today, Glenn Ortz. We really appreciate you coming today and being a part of the worship. 
So listen, we're going to do an offering, but we're not going to listen to a video. We're going to listen to one of the gifted people in this congregation. It will astonish you. And so, listen to Sarah. I hope I didn't build you up too much. <laughs> Move her tongue that fast, which is really hard to believe, but <laughs> y'all please stand. Please pray with me. God of all creation, all that we have, all that we know, all that we are, first comes from you. Receive what we have back that you might use them, signs of our love and devotion to you, and that you might use them and us to grow your kingdom here in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. We give thanks to you, O God, creator, redeemer, sustainer of all that you have made. You make your covenant with us, calling us to love and serve you. When we are wandering in sin, you forgive us and lead us home. We give you thanks. For Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lived and died and rose for us and is coming in glory to reign again. And so as we gather around your table, we recall that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said take and drink all of you 
This cup is the new covenant, the new relationship in my blood shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering Christ's saving love, we celebrate this holy meal and offer ourselves to you, O God, with gratitude and praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, on your people gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. By your Spirit, make us one body in Christ, one mission and ministry to the world. Nourish us in faith, hope, and love, and strengthen us for service until we feast with you in glory. All praise and glory and honor are yours. Holy triune God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God given for you, the people of God, and all are invited. Thanks be to God. A little housekeeping. Today we're going to, uh, to take communion a little differently. I know that there's a better ecclesiastical name for this, but I learned here that we call it a drive-by. So you'll come forward. We'll do one side at a time. You'll come forward. You'll receive the host from me. And then if you will take a cup from the tray, the dark uh, fluid is uh, wine and the light uh, fluid on the inside is grape juice. If you'll go ahead and consume it, and then there are basket, baskets at each end uh, in which you can deposit your empty cup and then return to your seat by the outside aisle. You may be seated. Let's do them first.
receive this blessing. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Please pray with me. You come to us, O God, in these gifts of common things, bread and wine, and yet through faith in you, your true presence comes to us. Use it to nourish us as we go out from this place to witness to your grace and love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank those of you who are watching online for being with us today. There's a couple of announcements, not very many, and then we're going to get on to some other stuff because there's a bit going on today. If you're watching online, we ask you to like us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube. Also, if you live out your part of your discipleship, which is a mark of discipleship, that is giving, you can do so by either mailing it to us or you can stop by and visit or press the green button on the weekly update that comes to your inbox or you can go to our website and hit the give menu and there is a button there as well. Um, I'm going to let Sharon talk about this a little bit more. Um, today our youth are giving you or offering you an appreciation um, luncheon or brunch. And, you know, we're blessed right now to have a lot of momentum in our youth organization. And these young people are awesome. But about a third... We have a budget on our line item for it, or line item in our budget for it. It's about, that covers about a third of the cost. About a third of the cost comes from you, and about a third of the cost comes from parents. So you've been generous so far. They've done a lot, and you're going to see that in a minute. But uh, is there anything after this? What else is after this? Oh, there's a blood drive going on today. Uh, if you haven't signed up, you can go knock on the door and see if they have space for you. Uh, that's till 1.15. Is that it? Oh, yeah, this is important. We need you to sign up for uh, our pictorial directory. Listen, uh, maybe this might be a time when you want pictures of your family. This might be a good time for that. Or maybe you just don't need the picture and make it what Doris called her obituary picture. <laughs> Regardless, we need 75 units or families or individuals to sign up in order to make it most cost effective. So we're on our way there, so if you haven't signed up already, someone will be out here to talk to you, or you can just scan the UR code that's out there, uh, or in the inbox that comes to you, the weekly update that comes to you, and make an appointment, make a time to do that. Please do that, this is really important. And we're still collecting donations through the month of August for Lutheran World Relief. These are for the education backpacks, back-to-school backpacks that get sent all over the world. We don't need the backpacks. We just need the items that are on the list out there in the, uh, uh, on the information desk. So we'll do that through August. And I'll, I am also just bound to mention that we're still hiring at the day school. Our wages are competitive. It's a great place to work. Uh, they have nice staff and a great, you know, wonderful pastor that goes down and visits there every now and then. <laughs> Anybody have a birthday today? Just today? Whew, good. So I'm going to turn this over to Sharon, and she's going to set this up for you. This is just amazing. All right, so I want to start by saying thank you to the congregation for allowing me to work with this awesome group of kids that, yeah, <laughs> that have shown that they're not the future of this church. They're the church right now. Thank you for financially supporting us, whether it be through donations or our many, 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 many fundraisers you're approached with. Um, thank you for sharing your time, your talents, um, kind words, those texts when we're on a trip saying, hey, we're back at home um, praying for you. It means a lot to us. Um, and so we wanted to thank everyone for their kindness by inviting them to brunch. Um, that has, is provided and prepared by our awesome youth parents, um, and we've put together a video for you to see some of the things that we've done this year. So I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. Thank you. Um, Christ Lutheran Church and the youth, it's like a second family. Sharon, too, thank you. Thank y'all for the support, for the youth, and through everything the church has gone through.
Just want to say thank you to the whole congregation for supporting our youth events and trips. Um, none of this could be done without y'all, and thank you. for all you do. Thank you for helping our youth program. I just want to say thank you to everyone from the church who has either supported us financially or as people because they're both equally important in our walk with Christ. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much for supporting our youth group. Because of that, we get to do amazing things like visit Camp Luther Hill, and again, thank you. I want to thank you guys for your prayers and support. Thank you for supporting us with our activities and fundraisers. Lab was a fun experience and thank you for helping us get there. The things of earth are teeming In the light of your glory and grace I'll set the sights upon heaven I'm fixing my eyes on you
Hi, thank you guys for supporting me throughout the last couple of years. I would definitely say that with y'all's help and support, I've been able to grow in faith and be able to grow as a person in general. Without you guys, I would not be where I am today. This world can be cold and bitter It feels like we're in the dead of winter Waiting on something better But am I really gonna hide forever Over and over again I hear your voice in my head Hey, how was your canoeing? We got soaked. We how got come? splashed like 40 million times. Was it fun? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for supporting our youth group. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Love y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for supporting me at the Christ of the Church. Thank you. 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 Love y'all. That was awesome. Hey, we want to thank Landon for putting that together. He, he made that yesterday. We want to thank Sharon for all the hard work that she does. I want to thank the band. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. As you're able, please stand and we'll send ourselves out of here. Oh, and listen. Sorry. <laughs> Biscuits, gravy, scrambled eggs, it's no charge, all for you to say thank you.